Good afternoon, everyone. It is, it is already afternoon. This day, we plan it for months and months, and it seems like it goes by so quickly because it's so fun. My name is Gail Osterberg. I'm the Director of Communications for the Library of Congress, and I'm so happy to welcome you here today. Thank you for coming. Um, we're thrilled to see so many book lovers as we celebrate reading and literacy throughout the day at the National Book Festival, the 18th. Um, National Book Festival. I want to take a minute to say a big thank you to our festival sponsors. Without their support, not only would this event not be free, but it just wouldn't be possible at all. And so I would encourage you to, uh, at some point during the course of your day, stop down on the expo floor. Many of our sponsors are exhibiting down there. Tell them thank you for their support of reading and literacy. One of, and, and importantly, if you um, have enjoyed your day and if you've enjoyed the book festival in past years, I would also encourage you to consider contributing to the event. It's very easy, loc.gov forward slash donate. No contribution is too small, and they all help ensure that this event can continue um, into the future. Um, one of our sponsors, PBS, is here on the concourse downstairs. They are sharing out a brand new series that begins in just a couple weeks, The Great American Read. They kicked it off earlier this summer with host Meredith Vieira, and they surveyed readers just like yourself across the country, developed a list of America's 100 favorite novels, and they are asking that you stop downstairs and vote and throughout the fall they will be having weekly programs talking about the books on the list talking about the voting and counting down to announcing America's favorite novels so I encourage you to go see them cast your vote and then a couple of important um, logistical notes everyone please turn off your cell phones very important also very important our next author will be signing books from two to three in line number four. So please make a note of that as well because I know after hearing him, you are all going to want to go get that book and have him sign it for you. His book, his 14th suspense novel, is called The Switch. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read it. I read this book in one day. I was flying home to see my parents for my dad's 80th birthday after a series of long delays at the airport, which really worked well for me because I was reading this page turner and didn't want to put it down. I got home around 10 and I told my parents I would have to see them in the morning because I was really tired. And I went to bed and I turned off the lights and I finished this book with my cell phone light on so that they wouldn't know I was still awake, not talking to them. <laughs> this is actually, a, that is a true story. Um, in addition to being an incredible page turner and also really establishing for me a lasting craving for cold brew coffee, Something that I loved about this book was that in an hour of great need, the protagonist, Michael Tanner, turned to a library for information and safety. And being that I love our Library of Congress and libraries in general, I loved that part of the plot. The Associated Press calls this author a master at making the reader feel every emotion, jump at every shock, and squirm with every twist. Please welcome the author of best-selling and award-winning novels, including The Zero Hour, High Crimes, and Buried Secrets, the master of the modern thriller, in his debut appearance at the National Book Festival, Joseph Finder. Thank you, Gail, and thank you for saying my name right. I am Finder, not Finder. Um, a few years ago, I was on book tour, and I got on the plane in Boston, and I, I was ready to set off on my tour, and I saw someone sitting there on the plane reading one of my books. So I thought to myself, do you say something? Like, what do you do? I don't know. So I kept going, and it turned out I was seated in the row right behind this guy. And I could see him between the seats. I could see him reading the book. So I couldn't resist it anymore. And I finally said, I stuck my head in between the seats, and I said, uh, so the book, how is it? And I said, 
It gets a lot better by the end of the first chapter. I, I, um, I feel like I'm in a really interesting place these days with all of this information swirling around about Donald Trump and Russia and intelligence agencies and the deep state because the first thing I ever wrote for money was a book about a rich, powerful American businessman who was trying to conceal his connections to the Kremlin. That was my first book, a nonfiction book called Red Carpet, long out of print and deservedly so. Um, it was, it was in part the story of a guy named Dr. Armand Hammer. Some of you may remember who he is. Uh, Armand Hammer was an interesting guy. He was uh, a, the CEO of Occidental Petroleum. He was known as a philanthropist. He was also known as someone who had a personal connection to Lenin. And I, I, rem I, I was a graduate student at Harvard and I was training to be a Soviet expert. And I read this People magazine article on Dr. Armand Hammer, billionaire oil tycoon. And by the way, he's the great grandfather of Army Hammer. You know the actor Army Hammer? That's his great, great grandson. His great grandson. Um, so I was reading this article in People magazine about Dr. Armand Hammer. I was sitting at the dentist reading this article on, on, on Armand Hammer. It talked about what, how he was a friend of Lenin's and a philanthropist. The thing is, at the same time, I happened to be reading the letters of Lenin in Russian for a course I was taking in grad school. These were the letters of Lenin they don't translate from Russian to English. So, um, and in this letter, I found one, in this collection of letters, I found a letter from Lenin himself to Comrade Armin Hammer. And I looked at that, and I just thought, Comrade? I remember when, when, when Lenin called someone Comrade, that meant he was a member of the Communist Party, for sure. And I didn't quite get that. I was kind of surprised. And I did a little research, and I found out that Armand Hammer's father, a man named Julius Hammer, founded the American Communist Party. And Armand Hammer went over to Moscow to meet Lenin as an agent of his father's. And I thought, now this is interesting. Here is this great capitalist, this billionaire, who is a friend of Lenin's. And I thought there's a book in here. And I thought, you know something? I want to write. And I have to confess to you, what I really wanted to write was fiction, but I didn't have the courage. I thought, nonfiction is safer. So I'm going to write this safer, easier thing, this nonfiction book. So I scored an interview with Dr. Armin Hammer in his office in New York. And he was by then 85 or so, and I was scheduled to talk to him for two hours. And I started asking him general biographical questions. And about 15 minutes into my interview, I said, so tell me about your father. Your father, Julius Hammer, was a friend of Lenin's and a founder of the American Communist Party. I think that's quite interesting. Hammer stood up and he said, all right, this interview's over. Get this guy out of here. And he kicked me out. I thought, I think there's something there. <laughs> so I went to Moscow. I went to Moscow as a tourist, and in those days you had to go on a tour with in-tourist. And I, starting with some names I got from Russian emigres, I eventually tracked down a number of people in Moscow. 
One was a man who claimed to be the son of Armin Hammer's brother, Victor Hammer, who was living in Moscow, a man named Armand Viktorovich Hammer, living in Moscow all his life. He had been kept as a hostage. And I also met an old man who claimed to be Armin Hammer's case officer. That is, Hammer worked for the KGB, or the NKVD as it was called in those days. Um, now, this was interesting because I had a source in the CIA named, who was, was in the CIA, this kind of legendary chief of counterintelligence named James Jesus Angleton. And Angleton, the chief of counterintelligence for the CIA, told me that he believed Armin Hammer was a Soviet agent. And I didn't believe him. I said, what's the proof? He kind of was vague, which told me there really wasn't any proof. But I decided I was going to find that proof, and I did. I found this case officer. So at the end of this day in which I had found both this man who was the son of Hammer's brother and this case officer, the phone rang in my hotel room in Moscow, and it was someone with the MVD, with the police, asking me what I was doing in Moscow, because I clearly wasn't on my tour group. And I quite bluntly told him I was doing investigative journalism. And he said, Moscow does not believe in investigative journalism. And he suggested that I leave the country right away. Because if I didn't, something would happen to me. And you know what? I didn't need to find out. I, left, I actually left the country at that point. Um, I started getting phone calls when I was back in the US from people who worked for Dr. Hammer, who worked for Occidental Petroleum, who told me, one guy told me, hey, piece of friendly advice, Dr. Hammer is very litigious. And he's going to sue you for libel. He's going to sue you out of your socks. I remember that expression, going to sue you out of your socks. So I was a graduate student living in Central Square in Cambridge, and all I could afford to pay for rent was $245 a month. And I'm thinking, sue me out of my socks. These are socks with holes in them, you know? Um, Hammer then called my faculty advisor at Harvard and told him that he was prepared to make Harvard a large gift. He wanted to give Harvard a gift of $20 million and the Hammer papers, his personal papers. Just one request, if you could get rid of this annoying graduate student named Joseph Fender. And I believe this is the first time in the history of Harvard University that they ever turned down money. But they actually turned that one down. And the day before my book went on sale, um, I was reading the New York Times. I got it, I was in New York and I got it, you know. Remember back in the days you could get the New York Times early, you could get it at midnight before it came out in the morning, I was so excited. And there I found on the op-ed page of the Times a piece by a lawyer named Louis Neiser. And Louis Neiser, who was once a well-known attorney, um, was also Armin Hammer's lawyer. And this was a piece about libel law. <laughs> and in this piece, Louis Neiser says that one of his clients and dear friends has been libeled in a new book. And of course, according to the conventional definitions, his client was a public figure and therefore couldn't sue for libel. He said, it's time to change the libel law. And I read that, and I just went, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this is trouble. They then, Hammer then, um, had his people t 
talk to my publisher and tell them that they considered this book libelous and they, were, they wanted to sue for libel. And my publisher, of course, was nervous because that's what publishers are. They get nervous about these sorts of things. And they said, well, it's a small print run. They printed 10,000 copies. That's it. When it's done, we won't print any more. That'll be the end of this book. Don't worry about it. They couldn't kill it off. They couldn't kill the book off by a threat of libel suit or by threatening me directly. So, Hammer had his people buy up as many copies as they could find in the stores around the country. And the book sold really well. <laughs> I mean, it sold out. This is what publishers call a clean sell-through. And I realized during this whole time that there was, I was able to say a lot about Arm & Hammer in my nonfiction, but I was too responsible and too determined not to be sued for libel to tell the whole story. And I realized that that man I had met in Moscow, that Armin Viktorovich Hammer, was probably not the son of Armin Hammer's brother, was probably Armin Hammer's son himself. Because what I'd been told is that they kept him as a hostage to ensure that Armin Hammer, who went to Moscow in the 20s, met a woman, met a Russian woman, had a baby, left the country, left the wife and the child behind. I think as a hostage. Anyway, I realized there were aspects to this story that I really couldn't tell in nonfiction. I had to tell in fiction. I decided to give fiction a try. Now remember, I was afraid to write a novel uh, because I thought that was too dangerous, that was too risky. I wanted to do something safer, like write a nonfiction book, right? Um, what I discovered, actually, in writing fiction was that people would talk to me and tell me things, reveal things, that they would never tell the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. It was the fact that I was writing fiction that made it safe for them to talk to me. And I was able to find out all kinds of things and tell all kinds of things in fiction that you can't do in nonfiction. What I love to do, what I've loved from the beginning, is finding things out doing research, finding out inside information that we're not supposed to know, and passing that along to my readers. So, for instance, my first novel, called The Moscow Club, dealt with a fictional Armand Hammer. But its plot was about a coup d'etat in the Kremlin against Gorbachev. And, you know, I had read a lot of Frederick Forsyth, and it occurred to me it would be kind of cool to actually put in real names the way Forsyth did. So I put in Gorbachev. I put in the names of the people who would pull off this coup, this fictional coup against Gorbachev. The book came out, finally, in February of 1991. And one of the first reviewers talked about how its plot was far-fetched. This plot about a coup against Gorbachev. Far-fetched. Six months later, this is August of 91, I get awakened early in the morning by one of my sources in the CIA who said, are you watching CNN? I said, well, no, what are you talking about? He said, put it on, and I did. There were tanks rumbling through the streets of Moscow. Gorbachev was under house arrest in the Black Sea. There had been a coup d'etat. The guy said to me, do you see who's involved in the coup? And I realized the people who had pulled off the real life coup attempt against Gorbachev were the people I named in my novel. He said, you think someone read the book? 
So it wasn't, it wasn't that I had any particular talent at Kremlinology or Sovietology. It wasn't that I could predict the future. What I realized is I was willing to listen to some of the crazier theories out there, some of the rumors that were circulating in Langley, Virginia, and take some of them seriously. I was basically willing to stick my neck out and make a fool out of myself. And it so happened in this case, I didn't make a fool out of myself. Um, but I learned in the process, here was a way to sort of write about real stuff, write about espionage and spy stuff and international relations, do it in a way that's entertaining and that actually provides new inside information. But I have to admit, I didn't always stick my neck out. Um, I was working on a book a long time ago on the Russian mafia, Russian organized crime. Now, as some of you may know, Russian organized crime has taken an interesting turn over the last few years. There are oligarchs who are now connected with organized crime who have taken most of Russia's assets out and who are now, some of them, billionaires. Um, I wanted to do a story about what it was like to actually be in one of these groups in my novel. So I found a source who was in one of these organized crime groups in Moscow who said he would sneak me in, I would just wear a fur hat and look like a Russian, that means wear kind of a zhlubby overcoat, you know, and bad shoes and a fur hat, and I would sneak into this meeting and I would basically observe and people would think I was Russian and that was fine. And this would be this really cool bit of research I could do for my novel. So I get a phone call at my hotel room again. The guy says, there's a rumor going around that someone from the CIA is about to infiltrate our meeting tonight. And they think this someone from the CIA is you. I said, I'm not in, in the CIA, really. And they said, that's not what they believe. If you go, I can't tell you what could happen to you. Well, I had a little baby at that point. And I just thought, is it worth it, really, to write a novel? I don't think so. So I left Moscow as soon as I could the next morning, decided not to go to that meeting. I decided that as interested as I was in the Russian mafia, it wasn't worth getting killed over for a thriller. By the way, I wasn't in the CIA, um, although I admit I thought about it. Since I was sort of a Russia expert back in the day, that is, I spoke Russian, I knew Russian history, I knew Soviet politics. I was naturally recruited to the CIA. They did that a lot at Yale, by the way, you know. Um, I was recruited and um, here is the problem. I had read a lot of Robert Ludlum's thrillers. <laughs> you know, the Bourne identity and things like that. So I thought that if you worked for the CIA, they gave you a Glock pistol and several fake passports and a Swiss bank account. And it turned out, in fact, I would be sitting at a cubicle translating Tractor Digest from Russian to English all day. And I thought, this doesn't sound quite as interesting as I expected. So basically, writing about, you know, the sorghum harvest in the Soviet Union, in the Ukraine, 1953 to 1955. Um, basically, Robert Ludlum ruined it for me. Now, speaking of Ludlum, one of the questions I get asked most of all uh, is about my books is, is it going to be a movie? You, get, you hear this all the time because the book hasn't really graduated from college until it's become a movie, you know? That's how people think about it, right? Um, I have actually had two movies made, which beats the odds. 
to one good, rather, one good, one not so good, uh, which also beats the odds. The one that I like is called High Crimes, which stars Morgan Freeman and Ashley Judd. And this is a story about a woman who's a professor at Harvard Law School. In the movie, she's, of course, not a professor at Harvard Law School. In the movie, she's a criminal defense attorney in San Francisco, anyway. Um, and in the book, she discovers that her husband had some sort of a secret life and is accused of a terrible atrocity, and she decides to defend him in the military courtroom where she is not an expert, and she brings in Morgan Freeman, who is an expert in military law. So this is the basic setup. It's a, it's a military trial. This is the basic setup of high crimes. So my agent, my Hollywood agent, called me up and said, you know, this movie actually might get made because there's a lot of heat around it and a lot of buzz. And when there's heat and buzz in Hollywood, well, there's always heat and buzz in Hollywood, isn't there? Uh, the truth is, 90, 95% of books that get optioned for the movies will never make it into a, never become a movie or a TV show. Um, so I was a little skeptical about this. And I said, he said, no, no, my agent said, no, really? Um, we have a director, his name is Carl Franklin, he wants to make this. We have a really good screenplay. Uh, Ashley Judd wants to play the lead. Morgan Freeman wants to play the other lead. This is going to get green lit. I said, okay, if it really is, I want a cameo. <laughs> is that so much to ask? I mean, I did write the book, right? I said, Hitchcock did it. So my agent said, Joe, you're not Hitchcock. <laughs> he was the director of the movies. He put himself in the movie. You are the writer of the book. And in the totem pole that is Hollywood, I'm below ground. <laughs> That's just the way it works. So he said, you're not going to get a cameo. I'm sorry. And I said, well, ask him anyway. So one day, my agent called me a few weeks later, and he said, all right, good news and bad news. What do you want to hear first? So I said, the good news always. He said, the good news is the director has agreed to put you in a cameo in the movie. The bad news, you're going to have to shave your head because <laughs> you're in a military jury. You're going to be on the jury in a military trial, and you are basically playing a Marine and they're going to shave your head high and tight, you know? And I said, that's fine. I'll go do it myself. I'll go out to Great Cuts and have this done, you know? No, 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 no. No, you got to have it done by the makeup and hair people. So they flew me out there, and I met with the director. And remember, I was supposed to be in the jury in this movie. Now, you know, they don't really show the jury very often in movies. They sort of pan across the jury kind of slowly sometimes. I knew that the odds were I would hit the cutting room floor. I would not actually be in the movie. But still, being in the jury, being on the movie set at all, sounded like something cool. So there I was talking to the director before I went to hair and makeup. And he said, you know, you've got a certain authority. I said, yes, I do. He said, let's promote this guy. And on the spot, I was promoted from mere member of the jury to member of the prosecution team. I was one of the prosecutors, and I got to sit at the prosecutor's table. My job, and they told me this, my job was to glare at Morgan Freeman, <laughs> all right? So I was practicing, practicing this. I was sort of like staring at him, glaring at him, and he glared back, you know. Um, 
They never gave me acting lessons. They never told me what to do. They just told me, glare at Morgan Freeman. And in fact, my character, later in the movie, beats him up. <laughs> and um, it wasn't me, it was someone else. Anyway, so the guy playing the prosecutor turned to me when I sat down. There I was in my high and tight and my marine uniform and everything. He said, so, uh, how you doing? I'm Mike. And I said, hey, Mike, I'm Joe. I had made a deal with the director that I was going to be incognito on the set. He, they did not want people on the set to know that I had written the book. Why? Presumably because uh, I would, maybe because actors would go, come up to me and say, this line isn't right, is it? How would you tweak this line? Don't you think we should add something here? For whatever reason, they were threatened by having the writer on the set. Interesting, isn't it? I agreed to basically be incognito, which meant that I would not tell them who I was, right? Um, so he said, so the guy playing the prosecutor said to me, I'm Mike, and I said, I'm Joe, and he said, so uh, where are you from? I said, Boston. He said, and this was in LA on the soundstage. He said, they flew you in from Boston for this part? <laughs> yeah. He said, do you know somebody? <laughs> no. <laughs> he then said, all right, so l let me tell you about high crimes. Let me tell you about the book and the movie and how they're different, actually. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the thematic underpinnings of this story. You really need to know how this really works thematically. And he spent about five minutes telling me all about high crimes, telling me the story, telling me what it was really about. <laughs> and I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and I finally said, I said, Mike, um, my name is Joseph Finder. I wrote the book the movie's based on. He said, oh, man, Morgan, Ashley, this guy wrote high crimes. <laughs> so my cover was blown. Um, but I decided, since my cover was blown, this was my opportunity to meet Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Try and stop me. Because I had been told not to talk to the stars. Below the line, that's okay, I could talk to, but don't talk to Ashley or Morgan, leave them alone. As an extra, do not talk to the stars. I said, okay. I saw Morgan Freeman standing there during a break with a guy who looked a lot like him, turned out to be his stand-in, who was also his personal assistant. So I went up to him and I said, excuse me, uh, Mr. Freeman, I just wanted to say hi. My name is Joe Finder. I wrote the book High Crimes that the movie's based on. And Freeman stared at me and he turned to his stand-in and he said, this gentleman here says he wrote the book the movie's based on, like I give a. <laughs> and like the blood rushed to my head. I just thought, Morgan Freeman's supposed to be the nicest guy in Hollywood. Oh man. And he went, ha ha ha, I got you, didn't I? <laughs> so the amazing thing is, I was sitting on the set of a movie that I had made up in my head a few years earlier. I was sitting, I remember sitting at my computer describing the courtroom, describing every detail of it, which they now perfectly had. And I thought, how cool is this? I made this up, just me sitting in my, in my office, sitting at a computer. It takes 500 people to make one of these movies, but I could do it myself. I thought that was kind of cool. I acted, I use that term lightly, I acted in, in five scenes, which meant I was shooting for five days. And I got paid for this. I got paid $200 per day, so I got paid $1,000 to act in high crimes. But there's a rule that if you're in a movie for three days or more, you have to join SAG, the Screen Actors Guild which costs $1,500. <laughs>
But I joined it. I had no choice. There's a lesson there. I'm not sure what it is. Anyway, the other movie that's made from my books is called Paranoia, starring Harrison Ford and Gary Oldman. And you're thinking, I haven't heard of that movie. It's a Harrison Ford movie. I haven't heard of it. There's a reason you haven't heard about it. The less said about that one, the better. My attitude about movie adaptations, um, people would say to me things like, so what did you think about what they did to paranoia? What do you think? I remember there is a great line from the author James M. Cain, who wrote Double Indemnity. He was asked, how do you feel about what the movies did to your book? And he pointed to the shelf and he said, they didn't do anything, the book's still here. And that's sort of how I feel is, the book is still here. I don't care as long as it works as a movie. So, I need to tell you a secret, and that is, which I'm telling to this small group here, because we're in genre fiction, we're all, we're all you know, you're my people. Um, but I use my fiction as a way to comment on what's going around us. I sneak it in. And unlike the movies, I'm the boss, which I like. My most recent book is called The Switch. It's about a businessman in Boston, a coffee entrepreneur. One day he's going through LAX, the airport, and um, he's in the security line, and he reaches down to grab his MacBook Air from the security line, and he sees two identical MacBook Airs, and he picks up the wrong one, goes onto the plane, gets home to Boston, and realizes he has a computer here that belongs to a U.S. senator, and on it is some top secret classified information. And I thought, now this could be kind of interesting as I was putting this together. My hero's life is going to be turned upside down. Why? Because he's not going to return it. That's all I had, and that's what I created. So Switch, the Switch, turns out to be about this one guy's struggle to survive, but on another level, it's about something else. It's about how we're giving up our own privacy. The secret information on this computer has to do with an NSA surveillance program that I describe in the book and which is true. Um, there's a sequence in the book when my hero, Michael Tanner, has to go on the lam. You know, in thrillers you have to go on the lam quite a bit. I'm not sure what the lam is, but people go on the lam a lot, all right. Michael realizes he can't rent a car, because that's going to set off lights all over the place. He can't use his credit cards, he's got about six dollars in his wallet. He can't use his ATM card can't get cash, and there are cameras everywhere he goes. I wanted to sort of, in the, this scene, in this sequence, show the extent to which I think we have given up our privacy. We all check, you know these privacy notices that have been popping up all over the place whenever you go to a website recently? The last couple of weeks I've noticed this. I don't know if for, it's a European thing, I'm not exactly sure, but there's a little check here to indicate you have no privacy anymore which is basically what we do. We don't even, nobody reads those privacy documents. Um, I am here today representing genre fiction, specifically mysteries and thrillers. I hate the term genre fiction. It is condescending. But at the same time, I love my genre. I love mysteries and thrillers. I feel that it enables me to tell a story and at the same time reveal some inside information, something important, something I think we should be talking about. But let me be clear, my job is to entertain you. I want you to stay up too late to turn those pages and be a wreck the next day at work. That's really my objective. Um, because, thank you. Um, we all crave stories whether through TV, or stories through movies, or stories through that 
superior content delivery system, books. But we also love learning things, finding out more about the world, which works for me because I love finding things out and telling people about them. So I sort of feel that I've traveled full circle in my writing. How could I not be obsessed with another billionaire American businessman with hidden connections to the Kremlin? Right? I heard steel dossier and, you know, I was hooked at that point, right? Steel, I mean, this is an amazing story. Um, and I'm making light of it, I will be honest. I'm really worried about what's going on in our country. I'm worried about what's gonna happen when Mueller comes out with his report. Um, this is not like Watergate. There was no Fox News in 1973 and 1974. Um, I worry about what's happening at the FBI and what's, what's happening at the CIA. Um, in, in my new book, I mean, imagine how weird it is, by the way, to be writing conspiracy stories at a time when we're hearing about conspiracies every day coming out of the White House. That sort of blows my mind. In my new book, I deal with the Russian notion of kompromat, which is the use of secret, damaging secret information to blackmail or to ensure loyalty. In my new book, it's used against a female judge who's made one bad mistake. That book is called Judgment. It's due out at the end of next year. It, it may not be the only book called Judgment. This is, I, I don't know, I, I worry about the title. You know, there are, there are other books called Judgment, but, but you can't copyright titles, I learned. So I've decided that my next book is gonna be called The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> I'd love to answer any questions. Who would like to start? Hi, um, short preamble. My father worked for the DOD for over 40 years. For um, DOJ? For the DOD. DOD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone in this room knows what that is. Um, <laughs> I'm from uh, Boston. <laughs> so in, in the 70s, he was working um, with submarines. And when Clancy's Hunt for Red October came out, I distinctly remember watching him read that book. And at a certain point in the book, he said, what? <laughs> what? And he shut the book, went to the phone, made a phone call, and said, have you read Clancy's book? Who is talking to him? So my question for you is, what is the process like when a source gives you information that you know is delicious but maybe shouldn't go in the book? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an excellent question um, because it's almost irresistible. The investigative journalist part of me wants to get that out, wants to get whatever it is out. But at the same time, if I blow my sources, I've wrecked it for myself, for any other source who wants to pay attention, who wants to help me out. So I have really decided um, I have held things back uh, because I was told to. So basically, I, I, unlike Clancy, I basically tend to observe those rules. However, if I can find that out by some other means, that's what I try to do, is try to get it in there if possible. Thank you. I'm looking around. Are there other questions? Yes. Right. I sort of, I will basically um, think of the story, think of the character, and then um, I'll decide what I want to learn about. And it so happened when I was writing The Switch, 
that I was really interested in coffee companies and, co and the sale of coffee and artisan coffee and how that's happened. And I decided this would be a really interesting way of exploring that. Um, when I wrote Judgment, I decided I'm going to look at what it's like to be a judge because I have no idea what that's like. So I sort of pick things almost at random that appeal to me and hope that it appeals to the readers as well. This is probably our last question because I've got to wrap it up. So uh, when you were discussing uh, the potential uh, CIA job that's just uh, sitting in a cubicle uh, translating almanacs, uh, first thing I actually thought of was uh, Le Carre, who's basically yeah. running a theme is that people who did stuff like that uh, fought most of the Cold War mm -hmm. in so many words. Do you think that there is a compelling thriller to be written about that from the American side of things, or are we just too impatient for that? Were we just what? Or are we just too impatient for that? I think we're too impatient for it. I don't think it would work, really, as a thriller. And, you know, there's a question that I, I think about a lot, and that is, what did spies do for us, ultimately? Did we, quote unquote, win the Cold War because of espionage? And I think the answer is no. Uh, and that, as much as I value and respect the CIA, you have to keep in mind the, the utility that spies give us is sometimes not as much as people think because of guys like me who write stories in which spies are lauded. Um, anyway, let me wrap it up right there. Thank, Thank you. you so much.